The reckon it took a full year's solid work to turn a farm boy into a fully fledged navvy. The railway age began in 1822 and it started snatching boys and men fit up into the country to spend the rest of their lives being navvies, stonemasons, brickies, carpenters and blacksmiths. And all this just so they could transport coal from one end of the country to the other. There was never any sort of standardisation or nationalisation of these railway projects as a whole over the country. But then it would be left into the private companies who would be competing for manpower and for profit. This meant that labour was cheap-ish, but lives were even cheaper. Men were blown up, they were crushed by fallen stones, they were crushed by fallen tunnels. They were hit by moving trains, some took some flying bricks to the heat, and there was never even an official death count of these men. And so the next time you're heading on holiday, or heading into work, have a look at the bridges and the tunnels and all the walls along the railway, and spare a thought for the boys that built it. These boys, when they had tried to introduce some steam-powered shovels, a steam shovel, the Naves decided to break it. And I think sometimes that we need to recognise the moment that we're all in. Nowadays you sort of have people that are more than happy to let machines take their jobs. I don't know if they're happy or if they're just forced to have to give these jobs away basically. But there once was a time when everybody stood together and everybody stuck together and realised that if they didn't have this work, they would starve. Some of these bands of navvies even went as far as to sort of set up cooperative societies for each other, for widows and for children, uh, people that had been killed on the lines, for sick pay. And just remember this, none of this was set up by the employer. It was all done by the men themselves. And I've said this in a previous video, but just remember, if, if you're a tradesman, You've got more in common with another tradesman anywhere else in the world than either of you have with any of your politicians or your oligarchy. We should be in this together, just like these lads were. So, the reason that they would have smashed the steam shovel was because it would have taken wages away for the guys, and that was the on. To be honest, there's only so much a machine can do. So, good on them. That was basically a strike. Think about it. These boys just wanted wages, basically. They to be paid, paid fairly. They wanted to drink. Imagine that. Believe it or not, skilled labour was actually easier to come by than unskilled labour because of the sort of population densities at the time. And so the actual railway buildings and the big houses and the sort of nicer looking things that you see on the railway, they were all done by local tradesmen, local stonemasons and brickies and stuff like that. They were, uh, they were supplied by local collieries and local quarries. This would make it easier to match into the vernacular, having local tradesmen and being able to just sort of match into the stuff that they're used to, all the different wall styles, all the different... Uh, types of architecture. This would mean that because of the massive amount of unskilled labour that would be needed, these railways would have travelling shanty towns with diff a different, whole, whole different mix of people living in these towns. And great swathes of these navvies would descend on these towns and sometimes these towns would maybe only have three or four thousand people. And the navvies would take through 1,500, 2,000 people through these towns. And it must have just been absolute carnage. Now, I work manual labour for a living. I cannot fathom having to do everything by hand when you can have machines there. And this could only have been brought on by just complete necessity because Absolutely no one would choose to walk a wheelbarrow up 40 foot 
a way up a tight gradient being dragged up by a horse just so that they can feed the family. It just, it's crazy. Who would want to be shoveling for a living? It's back breaking, but... So when the lads were getting paid probably monthly, or sometimes, like every three months, they would just basically have one big piss up and they would spend other wages on drink. Just get wrecked and just cause a nuisance in the towns. And so what the what the building companies did for or the subcontractors would would they set up like a tuck shop, which was basically tick, or you would get a loan basically. So you would get up to sort of your amount in wages and what you would get paid that day. This was a bit of a problem because you were getting undersold, you were getting underweight, you were getting basically watered in beer, stuff like that. So these lads were basically just getting rinsed at every, every turn, basically. Scottish lads, Irish lads, English lads as well. The Scottish and the Irish lads basically detested each other and English and Irish detested each other. The reason for this sentiment was simple. The Irish worked for less money, basically. The Scottish and the English didn't like it. It was driving their wages down. They were getting fed up and so they just needed excuses, basically, or made up excuses to attack them. In Gore Bridge, probably 40 minutes up that way, where these bricks are from, Arniston. So there was a colliery up there. And the byproduct were these bricks, <laughs> these clay bricks. Midlothian in Scotland was a massive coal field and they needed a train line to go from Midlothian down into Gala Shales and Hoyk and all that where they had a massive sort of textile industry. I feel as though if these lads had worked on the same stretch of line as each other, they probably would have became really good pals. During the building of this line in 1846, this exact stretch of line would see tensions really rise between the Irish, the Scottish and the English. I found this in a couple of books. I've been reading The Railway Navies by Terry Coleman, and this was uh, suggested to me by Tobias, which is one of my followers on TikTok, so I appreciate you, Tobias, and thanks for all the recommendations. And the second book uh, that I found this in was Rails Across the Border. I'm just going to read a wee excerpt for the book. Work inched southwards from Edinburgh in the conquest of the borders, and not without death stocking the steps of the railway makers. By February 1846, two ten-mile sections were in the course of a construction north and south of Fushy Bridge, a now vanished village to the south of Gore Bridge. The more northern of these was manned by Irish navvies, the section south of it by a mixture of Scottish and English labourers. Relations between the two sets of men were not good and at the end of the month, payday, the area was to witness one of the most unpleasant incidents involving railway labourers in the whole of the United Kingdom. It appears that owing to the infamous Tommy system, the Irish workforce received less than they took to be their due at that fateful Saturday, and there were mutterings among the men and as many of them drowned their sorrows in a Gorebridge Inn. When a peddler unwisely passed two watches around among them to negotiate sales, he found it necessary to call the constabulary to recover the timepieces, which had immediately gone missing. Unfortunately, the turmoil that followed, two Irishmen were arrested, only to be released by a gun-packing mob of Irishmen who overcame the local police. Even worse than this, the triumphant navvies encountered two other officers attempting to hide from the reproach and promptly bludgeoned one of them, Constable Richard Pace of the County Police, insensible. Neighbours carried him to his home nearby, but he died the following evening, leaving a widow. This murder triggered a reaction from the Scottish and English navvies also in the area and approximately 1,000 of them decided to take the law into their own hands. After putting a force of Irishmen to flight in nearby Crichton, the enraged navvies destroyed the huts in which the Irish lived, 
apparently with the police looking on. Ironically, Irish dragoons were sent from Pearsall Barracks in Edinburgh to help restore order that weekend, and the local sheriff was successful in stopping a counterforce of Irish labourers and advancing from Edinburgh to the scene. By the following Thursday, both sets of navvies were back at work, while at Borthwick Kirkyard the body of Constable Pace was laid to rest, a forgotten martyr to the inexorable progress of the railway. I think being on a site with these guys would have been absolutely mental. Imagine the stories that you would have heard on that, those sort of sites. I always wondered if they had gloves. Now, I can never really find records yet. I would probably say that gloves are pretty expensive. And my hands get knackered. They get splits in them. Focus. Focus. There you focus. There we go. They get splits. They're dry constantly. I do wear gloves. But these boys probably just never wore gloves. They just had no health and safety at all. Just a pick, a shovel, a wheelbarrow, massive big barrow runs. Right, so we're nearly halfway through this video. This uh, specific video is a bit of an introduction. I would like to do three, four, or maybe five, or maybe even six videos on how they built the tunnels, how they built the bridges, the viaducts, how they built the sort of stations and stuff like that. So stay tuned, let me know which ones you want to hear about first and I'll try and prioritise them. But thanks for uh, watching these videos, I hope you're enjoying them. I'll get more into construction, the actual construction in these future videos. But hope you enjoy this one, enjoy the rest. Let me know if you enjoy it and like and subscribe. So in these huge cuttings, they would have a horse at the top of these hills, these cuttings. So they'd dig a V in the valley, a V straight through anywhere they had to get it flat. And what would happen is they would put embankments up and they would cast huge wooden ramps up these embankments. And they would tie a, ro a rope to their waist and one rope to the wheelbarrow and the horses would basically pull them up on a pulley system. <laughs> There's a, obviously a few injuries. You imagine being strapped to a horse and you're actually strapped to a rope and uh, you get basically thrown off this wooden scaffold ramp and you get pulled up by one horsepower all the way up the ramp. I think that would be very nice, would it? They've done this all day, every day. And they just got absolutely steaming. Drunk all the time. Just living in squalor. And just drinking, working. Sometimes the navvies would uh, they'd put their boots on new. And they wouldn't take their boots back off again until they were basically worn through. So I don't know how long that would take. But I would imagine, Ted, that maybe they would... Boots, maybe if one was more knackered than the other, they would just replace one at a time, maybe, actually. Because the Romans would do that. With their, uh, with their military boots, with their, Cali with their Caligai, they would just replace one at a time. Which is interesting. So I wonder if the nav is, would they just replace one boot at a time? People probably camped out here. And there's shanty tins, a couple of thousand people maybe in these fields in here, closer to the stream maybe. Local stonemasons for local quarries, and their local brickies would have been used to build a bridge like this. And all the navvies would have came from far and wide, essentially. You can imagine. And up here, you would have had a massive profile, and you can actually see where the mortar, some of the line mortar still is, and where it's flat. That's where the that's where the arch centre would have been, and they would have just tipped all the stones and built them in, and just filled them in over the top. And so this excess spill of the mortar would come over the face of the stones. And the, the nicely dressed 
arches here. These are like a, these are actually ramp and twist. This is a more difficult thing you would imagine. So if you imagine having to curve and come round at an angle and go up as well at the same time, so it's called ramp and twist. And so th these railways weren't they just all manual labour. A lot of it was skill. A lot of the tunnels and a lot of the bridges was purely skill and decent craftsmanship. And how many masons back in the day would have been running about with probably any missing fingers? If you like choppers and just machinery and that. Imagine the amount of shite that comes at a hole three miles long. Now these bricks, the Etna ones, are from out at Arnmadale near West Lothian. And as you go towards Broxburn, there is a massive viaduct, which would have carried the railways. You can just imagine being like somebody if you, I mean, I would, I would probably say that there was Probably people from abroad as well, France and stuff like that, America. So I think they would be coming across to work as specialists and in certain things. I, th I don't think it was basically all labour. I think uh, quite a lot of these guys would have carried with them. There's a, com a couple of companies have came up while I've been doing my research for the last few videos, and one of them is, is Cubits. So I might do a specific video on Cubits, which was a, a massive sort of company much like um maybe cure construction or something like that so they're a big big outfit um built a lot of really famous buildings in london some chimneys and railways so if you want to hear about the cubits let me know and i'll potentially do a video if, if you want boys have worked hard Party tart. You got paid at irregular intervals sometimes, not even monthly, could be a long time apart. So, whew, hard. And to be fair, boys were only really working 10 hour days, really. They were working on piecework, on price or piecework or price work. So basically, they would just fill their, their, up their quota for the day and if they wanted to make more, they could make more. But if you're getting paid so regularly and you're basically illiterate, how are you going to keep track of that? So I would reckon they would probably just do their quotas per day and just sack it and go home and get pissed, basically. Um, and if you're getting paid half in, well, not half in beer, but you get a paid a portion of your wages and beer. Imagine being, imagine going through swamps and uh, forests and all that to basically build a railway and you're just getting attacked by midges and by just horrible things. You'd hardly be getting, hardly be getting any sleep. You're damp, wet all the time. Imagine your feet, it'd be stinking. Fungus. Yeah. And so it probably was in the Starbucks triple shot espressos they were drinking. It was probably beer. Thanks for watching. Keep an eye out for the next video on bridge builders and the next one after that will potentially be the tunnels. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.